Well, today we are in week four of our series called Minefield, and want to welcome everybody in, whatever campus you are joining us from, or if you're joining us online, we're grateful to have you with us today. And today we are going to be talking about one of the uh, biggest issues that we wrestle with in our minds, and it's also probably the one issue that we talk about the least um, with other people, certainly in church. Rarely do we talk about this issue. In fact, this is an issue that we work hard to conceal, to keep hidden, uh, to keep a secret from other people or from other people knowing about, but yet it's an issue that we need to talk about as a church. And the the issue we want to talk about today has to do with sexual thoughts, sexual temptation, um, lust, uh, pornography. Uh, This is a, a massive issue in our world today. And it's not just an issue that's out there in our world. This is an issue that has also invaded our church as well. And uh, there's no secret that the ease and uh, the accessibility that we have nowadays to sexually explicit material has never been as easy as it is right now. And just a matter of a few swipes of your finger, you can have access to so much material that is incredibly harmful and, uh, and damaging to people. And the reality is this isn't just a couple of people. This isn't just a couple of guys or a couple of ladies who are struggling this temptation. But the reality is someone you know, someone that is close to you, someone that you love, someone that you care about is probably struggling with this issue to one degree or another. So it's something that we have to talk about. And as we kind of begin this conversation, I want to help us by just understanding the cultural reality of where we're at. Where are we at today in in our world with what people are filling their minds with? This may not be a surprise to you, but pornography is one of the fastest growing industries around the world. And here's just a few stats on what people are consuming of what they are putting into their minds. 87% of college-aged men and 31% of college-aged women are looking at pornography. One out of five mobile searches are for pornography. Porn sites, they get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. Yearly, 69% of men and 40% of women will view pornography. Uh, And these numbers are not trending down. (laughs) These numbers are trending up. And there's a lot of ways that we could break down these numbers and talk about them. And remember, this is only um, self-reported numbers on pornography. This does not take into account all of the softer options that are out there, um, from swimsuit magazines to HBO to TV shows to, to movies. And remember, this isn't just an issue that men struggle with. More and more women are struggling with this as well. So this doesn't include the book, the TV show, or that movie that just stirs something inside of you emotionally that creates longing and desire. I mean, the numbers are way higher. This is a massive issue that impacts all of us to one degree or another. And my goal today, my goal today is not just to throw a bunch of statistics um, at you about the the porn industry. I've never met anyone who has experienced profound change in this area of their lives by just simply knowing how many billions of dollars um, is spent on this stuff. In fact, I'm not really going to spend a whole a lot of time on, on pornography because today my goal is to talk about a deeper issue. I want to talk about an internal issue. It's an issue within us, in our minds, that I believe is at the root of someone who is struggling with sexual thoughts or with pornography, and that issue is lust. That's what I want to talk about today, and I want to do that through looking at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. I'd invite you to turn there in your copy of God's Word, Matthew chapter 5. You can follow along in the Northridge Church app as well. But here in Matthew chapter 5, actually chapters 5, 6, and 7, we have this sermon that Jesus gives. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. This is like the initiation or the beginning of Jesus's public ministry. And he shares this sermon where he begins to explain what it looks like to live um, in relationship with God and this relationship with God that he desires to draw us into. And so Jesus has kind of gone through topic by topic. And here in Matthew um, chapter 5, verse 27, he begins to address issues of sexuality, of adultery, and lust. 
And look at what he says in verse 27. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. So right here, Jesus is referring to one of the big 10, one of the the 10 commandments from Exodus 20, um, don't commit adultery. But he continues and he says, but I say, anyone who even looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, I got to imagine at this moment, his disciples are like, oh, like Jesus, like, wow. Okay, those are some strong words. Um, I imagine like Peter's looking at John like, I mean, is he, is he serious about the whole pluck, pluck your eye out thing? I mean, these are some strong words of Jesus here. In fact, look at what he says about lust in verse 28. He says, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What Jesus is saying here is, look, this, this is an internal issue. This, this is about desire. This is about seeing someone or something and, and using them sexually in your mind. And we're going to define in more detail what lust is. But, but before we do that, I thought it'd be helpful for us to also understand what lust um, is not. And there's a couple of things that lust is not. First and foremost, lust is not thinking sexually about your spouse. That is not lust. If you're married, go to town, all right? In in the Bible, it describes that you are one flesh, that you belong to each other. So it's not lust. I know all the teenagers right now are like, oh man, like Nate, come on, really? I don't want to think about that, but too bad. It's reality. It happens. How do you think you got here anyways, all right? So lust, it's not thinking sexually about your spouse. And then number two, lust is not seeing an attractive person. And lust isn't acknowledging that they are attractive. That is not lust. I remember years ago, my wife Emily and I, we were in New York City, and we had just gotten off the subway, and we came up the stairs out around the Times Square area in in the city, and we were walking on the sidewalk, and it wasn't long before Emily was like, whatever you do, don't look across uh, the road. Now, you understand what that is, right? Like, That's a setup right there because what did I immediately do? I looked, I looked across the street and there across the road was this massive billboard with a woman that barely had anything on. Now just seeing that image is not lust. When it begins to cross into lust is when you look back a second time, a third time with this intention of wanting, of wanting to use that image or person sexually. So these are a few things that lust is not. And it's interesting, if we go back to verse 28, Jesus says, he says, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, in your heart. This is an internal issue. And I would imagine that there were many men and women who were there listening to teach that day, that when they heard Jesus say, you know, you've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery, where they were like, I'm good. I'm great here. I have never committed the, the act or the physical act of adultery. But then he says, but I say, even if you look with lust, you have committed adultery. You've already gone there because in your heart, in your mind, you have engaged in the act. You see, this is what Jesus does all the time throughout his teaching and throughout his life is that he moves. He presses in on what it means to be in a relationship with God. He's pressing in and he's saying, look, I'm not just after your behaviors or the checklist of the to-do list and all the externals. No, I'm after something deeper. I'm after your desires. I'm after your motivations. I'm after your heart and your mind so that you don't even desire to look with lust at someone or to commit the act of adultery. It's like Jesus is saying, it's possible that you have never cheated on your, on your spouse physically, externally, but in your heart you are just as guilty as someone who has because you are lusting after so many people in your mind. You're using them sexually. And part of what Jesus is beginning to unpack here for us is what true human sexuality is and what it means to be sexual. Because if we go all the way back to the beginning of our story in Genesis 1, we see that God creates everything good. Everything is good. 
And then in chapter two, though, we see that God says there is something that is not good. And the thing that God said is not good is for us to be alone, to be disconnected, or to be in isolation. God says that is not good. Loneliness is not good. And so woven into the fabric of every human being is this desire for connection, is this desire for connectedness. And part of that desire is tied to sexuality and to sex. In fact, in the Bible, it doesn't take very long before we're talking about sex. Four chapters. Four chapters into the Bible, we're talking about sex. Genesis 4, verse 1, it says this, And Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. Now, some other translations will actually say that Adam knew his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. Which, that can be really confusing to, to like, younger kids of, like, wait, hold on, like, Adam just knew his wife Eve, and she got pregnant? And this is where all the parents go, yes. That's exactly, that's why we don't date kids until we're 30 years old, right? All my parents, amen, out there, right? Now, now it's interesting, though, because the word translated knew or made love in Hebrew, it is the same word, and it means to know or to be known, and it carries with it this deep, intimate knowing where you know somebody else deeply, intimately, and vulnerably. And this word, it's used hundreds of times throughout the Old Testament. Sometimes it's tied to sex, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just tied to knowing somebody else in an intimate or in in a close way. But it's the same word because sex and connectedness, they are tied together, which is exactly why God gives us the gift of sex. Because sex is a beautiful expression of the knowing. It's a beautiful expression of the connectedness. And so he gives us this beautiful gift of sex that's to be shared between a husband and a wife who have faithfully committed themselves to one another in marriage. You see, sex, sex is not just a physical thing. It's not just a physical act. It's tied deeply into knowing and to being known. And what often happens, and this is so important that we understand this, what often happens in our world and in the culture around us is that if we regulate sex to being only a physical act, what it leads us to do is it, we start with sex to try to find the knowing. We start with sex to try to find the connectedness, but it was never designed to work that way. It was never intended to work that way. And I would imagine for some of you, maybe you look over this last year and, and you've been sleeping around. You've been having sex with multiple different people. Or for some of you, you've been regularly choosing to engage and use and look at pornography. And yet you would say you feel completely disconnected. And why is that? Well, it's because we're looking for connectedness, but we're using sex to try and get there, and it was never intended to work that way. And what lust does is lust begins to distort this God-given desire to be known for intimacy and connection, and it perverts it. It distorts it, and it leads us down so many destructive paths and roads. And that's what lust is. Lust is the distortion of a God-given desire for connectedness. And as I was thinking about, like, what, are, what is lust doing to our minds? It, like, how does lust distort? Well, I think it distorts in a few different ways. First, lust schemes. Lust schemes. James 4, verse 2, it says this, You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. Right? You lust for what you don't have, so you scheme. You'll even kill to get what you want. This is why you wait until everyone has gone to sleep before you turn on the computer. This is why you wait for your parents to leave or for them to go upstairs before you get on the computer because lust schemes. This is why we hide the text messages, lust schemes. It's drawing us into deceit. This is why if you're a married woman and you could go back this way to your office, but you choose to say, you know what, if I go this way, I may just bump into that that guy and man, Whenever, man, we run into one another and I just get this feeling when, when I talk with him and it might lead to a conversation, maybe you'll notice me. And so we choose to go that way. Man, lust, it's constantly finding new and creative ways to give us or to, for us to get what we want. 
lust, schemes. That's why affairs are never out in public. We hide, we scheme. It's why you don't look at pornography out in public. We scheme and we hide. And think with me for a moment. Think about where lust is leading us. Lust is leading us right back to the very thing that God said wasn't good. To be alone, to be disconnected, to be in isolation, which, which is the deep irony in all of this. But lust, it schemes. Not only that, lust uses. Lust uses. Colossians a 3 verse 5. It says this, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now, when we read this passage here, we see the idea of lust that's present here, but we also see this phrase, sexual immorality. And that, that, that phrase in the Greek, it's actually one word. It's the word porneia, which is where we get the word pornography from. And that word porneia, it's actually rooted in this word that carries with it this idea of selling and trading goods. So what Paul is telling us, what Jesus wants us to understand is that lust will actually lead you and I to a place where we begin to see people just simply as goods, as commodities, where we see, we take, we use, we throw away. We see, we take, we use, and we throw away. I actually think that this is why Jesus uses such strong language um, in Matthew chapter 5 about where lust will lead you and me. Look at what he says again in verse 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And then he repeats himself again. Verse 30, he says, and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus is saying that lust will lead you to hell. And he's absolutely brilliant here because he's talking about, in one sense, the finality, the future reality of hell, of eternal separation from God if we don't deal with our sin, where sin and lust can lead us. But he's also talking about a present reality of hell that we can experience right now in our lives that lust can lead us to. And I've, I've been in moments like that in my life. There have been moments where I, I have been in a family's home and the husband's over here on one side of the couch or the living room and the, the wife is on the other. And right there in that moment, it's being realized that the text messages were discovered. The search history was uncovered. The affair was brought into the light. And let me just tell you, there is just complete distrust, hurt, pain, brokenness, a very real sense of hell right there in that moment, in that family, just brokenness. And what Jesus is trying to help us understand and see is, look, lust can lead to you and I experiencing a very real hell now in our lives if it goes unchecked. And man, it can start with just a couple of thoughts, which lead to desire, which then lead to demands, which can lead to a moment of hell in our lives. So lust uses um, its schemes, but also lust. Lust will never be satisfied. Lust won't be satisfied. Second Peter 2.14, it says, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. Lust won't be satisfied. It's always one more. One more click, one more chapter, one more book, one more sight, one more night, one more image. It's always one more. It has this insatiable appetite to it. And this is, where, this is where pornography is so destructive, and I just want just to speak for a moment to the reality and the destruction of pornography. That if you're choosing to regularly engage in pornography, you, you are being taught lessons over and over and over again in your mind when you look at pornography. You are being taught that a real, a real person will never satisfy you. One person will never satisfy you. Your future spouse or your current spouse will never satisfy you because you're always going to need a fantasy one. You're always going to need another one. It's going to be one more click, one more image, one, one more. Lust is never satisfied. And many people are learning this lesson and being taught this over and over and over again. And this is ruining people's minds. It's ruining relationships. It's ruining um, careers. And it's, it's just, it's terrifying. 
And the reality is too, if you're here today and maybe you're like, man, I'm, I'm single or I'm, I'm young, um, if you refuse to place boundaries in the way that you think about others sexually, I promise you that just because you put a ring on someone's finger and then all of a sudden you'll place boundaries on this area of your life, that's just simply not true. If you're refusing to deal with this issue right now, a ring is not going to stop it later. And why is that? Because lust is never satisfied. And so I think for us in, in this moment, we kind of got to just pause here for a second and just ask ourselves some honest questions of like, where, where are you in this? Where am I in, in this? Where do, we, where do we go from here? And I think it starts by us looking within and having an honest conversation with ourselves. And this is where I think when it comes to winning the battle against lust in our minds is where this framework is so helpful to us that we have been working through over the last three weeks together. Where we come back to this and we help to gather our thoughts in our minds around what is going on in our heads. And it starts with us observing and examining our thoughts. You got to observe and examine your thoughts. Are you scheming? And how are you, are you scheming? Are you hiding things? Have you begun to just view people as commodities? You're robbing them of their dignity, of their humanity. Are you thinking, you know, I can just fix this on my, on my own. If I just try harder or do better on my own, I, I can fix this issue um, on my own. One of the things that, man, I, I truly have been thinking about and praying for leading into this talk and even just this next week as people are gonna be talking about this message, whether with your friends or in your community group, my hope and prayer is that for some people out there that this week will begin the, the start of healing because for the very first time, you'll be able to open up to a trusted friend, someone in your group, a group leader, or just someone who is close to you about this struggle where you'll bring this into the light. No one ever gets out of this struggle alone. And maybe you've been thinking, I can just fix this on my own. So you got to start by having an honest conversation with you. Observe, examine your thoughts. And then from there, we pray our thoughts. We take our thoughts to God and we pray them to him. And the first step in that prayer, the first step out is a prayer of confession. We confess our sin to God. Proverbs 28, 13, it says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. Meaning you, if you conceal your sin, you are actively working and fighting against God. But the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. You see, confession is that first step towards receiving God's mercy, his forgiveness, and his grace. Confession opens a pathway to healing and growth. We have to be willing to confess our sins. We pray our thoughts to God. And then from there, we rest our thoughts. We rest our thoughts. And this is so important when it comes to battling, especially an addiction with lust or with pornography. That for some of you, you are going to need to take some radical measures to cut off access to things you are being tempted with or are struggling with to allow your mind space to heal, to think, to grow, and to move forward. Radical measures. I mean, think about Jesus is absolutely right when he says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your arm causes you to sin, cut it out. Off. Now, obviously, you can still lust and sin without an eye or without an arm. And what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to wake you and I up to the seriousness of our sin and also to the measures that you and I might need to take to remove pieces of this, of this struggle in our lives. We're going to have to be aggressive, maybe even radical. I mean, think about it. Amputation is not easy. It's extraordinarily painful. And it even comes with this sense of loss with it. This, this, these measures can look a number of different ways for you. It could be the reality of you're just, instead of having a smartphone, you're going to get a dumb phone that doesn't have access to web browsers or to apps. Maybe you give passcodes to your spouse or to a trusted friend that can have access to your devices to see what's going on there. Maybe you just say, you know what, I am not going to go online by myself. When I go online, I'm going to be in the presence of other people Maybe it's, you know, I'm no longer going to read that author. I'm no longer going to watch that show. Maybe you got to cancel your TV subscription, remove apps from your phone. Maybe you got to put online software on your devices like Covenant Eyes or Ever Accountable. Remember, the, these measures, though, whatever it is for you, they're not meant to be convenient. They're meant to be tough. 
painful, costly. No one, think about amputation. No one removes a limb because it's fun. You do it because you realize you can't keep the limb and live. So you you may need to take some radical measures to give your mind space to rest your thoughts and to heal. And these radical measures, these radical measures don't solve your lust issue. They don't. They give you space to process and to heal, but they don't ultimately solve the issue because remember, this issue is internal. It's in our hearts and it's in our minds, which leads us to this last thought of repairing your thoughts where we repair our thoughts. And there is no better way to repair our thoughts than to run to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we remind ourselves that Jesus Christ died to set us free from every sin that we could ever commit, including the sin of lust or of pornography. Be consumed with Christ. I find so often that people are so consumed with sexual temptation or an addiction to pornography or to lust that it, it like consumes them. And it's almost like they begin to find their idea or their identity in their, in their struggle. They label themselves certain ways. It becomes their identity, but they're so consumed with their sin rather than being consumed with Christ. This struggle does not need to consume you. Christ is the answer. Run to him. He is the solution. Not just getting married. That's not the solution. Not just being able to have have sex is the solution. No, Christ is the solution. He is the only one that can fill that gap in our hearts of longing, that gap in desire for connection that we talked about. That can only be found in Christ. So be consumed with him. Be connected with him. When it comes to winning this battle in our our minds, with Christ, there is a way out. You can be free. You don't have to live in shame anymore. You don't have to live in isolation or run and hide anymore. There's forgiveness and freedom that can be found in Christ. No matter how many times you've looked at pornography or how hopeless this struggle can feel. And if you're struggling to believe this, it might be because you're more focused on yourself and on your sin than you are on Jesus and his grace. You can be free. You can win this battle in your mind, and it comes when we pursue Christ and when we are consumed with him. Would you pray with me? Father, man, I I, I pray that uh, for myself and for all of us, Lord, that This would be just an invitation, a calling back to you, Lord, that we would run to you, that we would find our strength, our identity in you. Lord, would you breathe hope and life into us, especially into an area of our lives that can feel so hopeless and dark and such a struggle, Lord, but I pray that we would rest in you. May we find our strength in you, Lord. And may we walk closely with you. We're so thankful, Lord, that you are quick to forgive and offer us grace and strength, Lord. Lord, may we be consumed with you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.